Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Tom Stewart here. I'm with Liz Trotter. Hey, Liz. Hey. And we've got a, a really special guest who's got the inside track on some of the big changes that's taken place with PPP over the last week. Matt Ricketts. Hey, Matt, how are you? Hey, good, Tom. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Thank you for, for helping us. You know, I chatted with Matt some here over the last day or so, and he spent a lot of time researching this month with uh, his CPA and got a uh, rare, fairly uh, intense uh, tutorial on, you know, how, what these changes mean. And it sounds like there's a lot of, a lot of uh, good news for us. Um, yeah. You want to share a little bit, Matt, about what you've learned? Yeah. So uh, my bank is uh, Midwest Bank Center out of St. Louis and um, they hosted, um, but they've been, my bank's been really great. They've been hosting like a series of weekly events, kind of keeping us appraised. And um, I've made about four of them out of the last, you know, 10 weeks. So I, you know, haven't been able to make all of them, but um, all of them have been really informative and uh, they've had good expertise. So we, we dived into the, the PPP and, um, a lot of the changes. So one of the big changes, obviously, is, you know, that they, they change it from an eight week to a 24 week window, basically. So the 24 week window basically pushes you right up to December 31st uh, versus the eight week window, which was from the, from the start of your money. Either way, um, I believe that the 24 week window um, kind of ends at the end of the year, like and your your twenty four week window could be a little bit before that, but they're not they're they're not taking any more applications for PPP after June thirtieth. So if you have not applied yet, you only have uh, two and a half more weeks or so to get an application in. So if you have not applied yet, um, I strongly suggest that you do so because um, almost all the money is forgivable. And we're we're going to kind of go through a couple scenarios where that where that kind of where that kind of plays out. But um, this is a great opportunity to put yourself in a strong financial position moving forward. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a, it's a no brainer as far as the way that they restructured this goes. So we all knew we had these eight weeks and we, we got our money. And um, some of us, we were doing, you know, probably paying bonuses or doing other things to kind of get the wheels back on. And, um, uh, you know, some people are, paying their grandma and their aunts and uncles to come work for them and, and all sorts of crazy stuff. We all kind of got scooped up in this, you know, this moment of like, how do we spend all this money? A um, couple things that I was worried about all along was, was that a, I was only paying my people 80% because I had for the first few weeks I had them on job share because I was trying to be logical with the money and trying to make it last. Um, so I knew I was going to have a bunch, a bunch of this money left over and I don't have a ton of overhead. So, I was going to have to return the money and pay, you know, the 1% interest on uh, probably by the time I paid them back 120 days or so. So not a whole lot of money um, that I would have had, how would it have cost me to do that? But, um, but now we all know that that's not the case. So um, I have a little over three and a half weeks left of payroll, even after my eight weeks is up because we were, kind of conservative, not as conservative as our friend Joe Walsh. I'll give him a plug if he's listening. Uh, Joe tried to talk us into doing some things his way and uh, his way is looking pretty intelligent right now of just being, you know, <laughs> believing that there would be changes and some uh, some restructuring of this. Joe, Joe has like always cautioned to just slow down through this whole process. Um, if you guys know Joe, uh, Joe is is a thinker and he – he deliberates before he does things where I'm more of like, let's get this done. Let's do this. You know? And Joe wasn't just thinking it was going to change. I mean, he was actively trying, participating, making it change. I mean, yeah, he gave me some great uh, copy for, you know, sending out uh, press releases to our local press. I got, you know, a lot of press in our local newspaper as well. And I think that whole snowball Joe was like a driving force of getting that out to a lot of business owners and you know, I took his I took his format, and I was able to to generate uh, two press interviews. And he was, I mean, he was quoted in CNN, Wall Street Journal, uh, I believe, several local newspapers uh, that I'm not that I'm that I don't know the names of. He got the ear of Senator Collins' office, and she was one of the sponsors of the original bill, and convinced you know her staff basically who 
manage the details of these things that they needed to make a change. And, you know, I think that that, I mean, was, was a, a real contributing factor to, to, to leading towards this change. So yeah. he worked, he worked hard. We, we owe him, a, we all owe him a debt of thanks. I think Joe, I think Joe was pretty instrumental in this and like, you know, we'll, we'll all have our, we'll all have our moments of, of, uh, you know, what we're good at. But I think Joe really showed what he's really good at is this, this grassroots organization and leadership uh, through this process. So um, anyway, so, we, you know, people like Joe got this to change. So we know that it went to eight weeks to 24 weeks. So here's the, here's the deal. You can still use the eight week window. And there, there might be some reason to, for some businesses to do the eight week window. Let's say you had, you had higher rent costs and things like that or whatever. Um, it's the, the, the eight week window might make sense if you spent almost all the money so far and you've, you've done it in a logical way, you haven't had any employee reductions and it's kind of like the devil, you know, right? Like, because the rules could change again. So for some businesses, if you have basically met all of the spend and done everything at this point, your eight week window might be what you want to use. Um, because it's either, it's, it's either, or it's either an eight week window or take the full 24. And we obviously know that we don't know anything anymore. Like the whole year could change again. We could have a down. I mean, anything could change between now and now. The criteria and have spent your money within the eight week window. Go yeah. for it now. You could go ahead and do your application now. What were you asking, Liz? And and I just wanted to say that you're you're right, Matt. We don't know anything because why, Tom? Because this is an unprecedented event. That's right. Here about seven minutes or so. Got it in. And really, how many times has have things changed? Yeah. So just having having the mindset that okay, this is the way it is, and it's not going to change, just seems like something Joe wouldn't do. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so Joe would have us think logically that things could change and and make your best decision today. But I think so. it's going to be a, a smaller subset of businesses that are able to to do the eight weeks and have spent all of the money down. Because one thing that I think, and, and I've mentioned this before, is one thing you have to consider is as you've been spending money, you have been accumulating some unforgivable portion of that money through payroll taxes. So your your FICA, your federal payroll taxes are not forgivable. The, the employee portion that, that you know that's coming out of their check. You know, obviously they paid that out of their check, but, you know, it kind of came out of PPP money because it's from total payroll. So um, none of that is forgivable. Just just rem remember that. So you've actually been creating a liability that you're going to have to pay back on the PPP anyway. But now we can avoid all of that. If you really, you know, here's the, here's the scenario that I'd like you to think about is, is let's say you use the full 24 weeks, which takes you about, you know, it takes you through whatever you've been doing so far, plus really almost all the way to the end of the year. There's going to be no clean breaks. You're not going to be able to break out of 941 and be like, "This is exactly what I spent." But you'll pull out your reports from your from your payroll processor, and you'll get you'll get the numbers. And just imagine this: let's say you get back to 75% for the year, and you've had a headcount reduction of 25%. Well, now you're not really worried about that that headcount re reduction. I'm going to use I'm going to use the number $250,000 as your loan because it's just a nice round number. And you normally would spend you normally would spend you know a million dollars a year in payroll. So over this period, you would probably normally expect to spend about seven hundred fifty thousand. Well, even if you only got up to like six hundred thousand in payroll for this whole period, and you still had to take a twenty five percent reduction, you're still what is that? That's like four hundred and seventy five thousand roughly that would be forgivable, and you only had a two hundred fifty thousand dollar loan. Even if you only got up to fifty percent of your of your headcount and all through this period, you only spent five hundred thousand on payroll through the rest of the year. Again, you you hit your fifty percent just in payroll. However, now you didn't probably cover your your tax liability of that portion. So you know, fifty percent probably doesn't quite hit the number you want, but some number above that plus twenty percent gets you gets you pretty close. It's pretty hard to miss the forgiveness. I don't want to get too complex, but just imagine what your payroll is per week multiplied out by 24. And let's say you're at, you know, you're at 100% now, but you plan on dropping back down a little bit because you didn't get fully staffed back up, um, you know, and you drop down to 80%. You might still average 90% headcount for the year. It, it, and 
you know, all of that, all of that is going to still lend to the, to the, unless there's another shutdown or anything else that like drives, um, you know, a big change in the market in the next few weeks, few, few months. Um, we're going to all be able to hit that forgiveness, full forgiveness of all the money that was lent to us and be able to probably get it, squeeze out a few more payrolls covered through this loan. And I think that's a, I think that's a, a big advantage. Um, if just as a question is, is there, are there lots of people in here listening today that still have, that still have some payrolls that they probably have left in their PPP funds? Anybody? I don't know if they're responding here. They, they probably will respond. I'm sure that there are quite a few people. I know of quite a few people that are got their monies late, et cetera. And Diane says, yes, she yeah. is. We have a couple other questions here too. Matt, I was wondering if now would be a good time for you to answer while we're waiting for, for some um, feedback on your question. I see a um, question. Uh, you saw Bridget? Okay. Yeah, can we apply for more? And, and no, it's, it's a one-time deal. Uh, wouldn't it be great, right? Like uh, to dip back into this bucket. This is an unprecedented event that the government just threw money into our into our businesses. I mean, I've been in business for 12 years. I never have asked the banks for money except for car loans and things like that on just secured debt. I've never been given unsecured debt for a cleaning company before. Uh, this is this is wild to to basically get one percent interest and 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 honestly. You know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be running negative for this period. Like, if you look at if you know, if I look at my profit and loss through this period, we lost money. You know, in general, but uh, the 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 general bank balance at the end of this is going to be up significantly, and that gives us a nice war chest for when this is over, in case there is anything else, and it gives us an opportunity to reinvest in our businesses, which is what they want us to do, and grow the economy. So. I'm looking at, you know, some reinvestments. I'm going to wait till I'm fairly confident that I don't need that money anymore. But uh, there are some investment opportunities we should all be thinking about, like whether it's, you know, operations or, you know, other other opportunities uh, to make our businesses run smoother. It doesn't an investment doesn't necessarily mean buying stocks, which I don't think is um, the way that I invest. I generally invest in property or invest in, you know, making my business make more money. Um, I have money in the stock market, but that's not what you can generally do with the money you've been lent. However, you could spend the money you've been lent, and then as your operating accounts grow back up, um, you could invest those monies because they're they're different they're different monies at that point. But you should be thinking about you know ways to grow your business and come out on the other side of this uh, with with more capital and more resources than you had prior. Except we're all probably struggling for employees for a few more weeks, so. I guess just for the forgiveness part, just to kind of recap that we've got a month, if we need it, we've got a much longer time to spend the PPP monies on the things that it's supposed to be spent on in 24 weeks, we should be able to spend it all on payroll. You yeah. Know? So, and it's, either, it's either or. So you either have to use the eight weeks. You can't just use any eight week period. It's the eight weeks from the, you know, the original rules or, or you go from the 24 week rule. So it's just one or the other. So if you don't do if you, if you don't spend your money in the eight, it seems like you'd want to take the twenty four. How does the the full employment part of this figure into it though? Because there was uh, I guess the June thirtieth date was something that yeah, we it's December thirty first. It's December thirty first now is going to be your is going to be kind of your your look back window now. So if you don't use that June thirtieth date, then then your other window is going to be. So what happens on December thirty first? What's the what's the expectation at that point? I mean, that's what they're going to. I want full forgiveness. What do I have to have in place on December thirty first? Well, I mean, you know, it's not even going to be percentage based. But like, if you and December thirty first is way past the twenty four week window for most of us. Yeah. We're what? What are we? Twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine weeks away from December 31st right now. So right, cuz that's from the end of, that's from July 1st basically is the 20 the 24 week runs from July 1st to the end of the year basically. So it's it's so uh, it doesn't start I mean it's not just a continuation of say I got my PPP money May 1st it's not just it no. it's basically it's basically a new window right after the June 30th window 24 I mean, 
basically everything I've done, if I went to 24 weeks, everything I've done now basically doesn't count. I'm just starting you, off. You would, count, you would count this all towards your number. You you could, you could everything you've done till now counts towards your number. And, and your 24 weeks does start from your from your loan period. But the look back window is December 31st. So so it's the look just like there was that that June 30th look back window that was probably after your eight weeks, depending on when you got your money. The the look back window now is December 31st. 100%. I have to go through the, the, the crazy calculation, right? But OK, so do it quarter by quarter. Let's say you get up to 80 percent employment this quarter and you spent 80 percent payroll wages. Let's say you did have a quarter where you dropped down to 50 percent. Things get bad again. And then you try, and then you get back up, you know, to seventy five percent. You still averaged sixty percent. It would still be really hard over the course of twenty four weeks, even at sixty percent of payroll, not to hit, not to hit one hundred percent forgiveness. So the real trick is not to fall below fifty percent employment. That's really the that's really going to be your danger point now. Is fifty percent employment? Fifty percent employment as part of the new. The new law? No, it's just that's that's what it's gonna you know for most people that's the line right. kind of draws where where you're below what you've needed to spend versus your loan um, because it's still tiered it's still based on I, I guess when you're talking about dollars I guess I'm thinking about full time equivalents that calculation I'm thinking full time equivalents too it's kind of it's kind of both to me because your full time equivalents is still affects how much percentage that they're gonna give you forgiveness on so. If you do like, and it's tiered. So let's say you had 75% of your employees, you're only going to get 75% of your loan forgiven. But let's say it's a million dollars that you spent on payroll now, um, and you get 75% of that forgiven. Well, that's $750,000 forgivable on a $250,000 loan. Not a bad, not a bad deal, right? Like you, it's all forgivable, um, even though you didn't really get that in a loan. So it it really ratchets up what is the forgivable portion? So we're not having to really worry about rent payments and, and utilities. I got a lot of clarity on utilities and things like that with the conversation of people are still trying to do the eight weeks. Um, there was, it's funny. It's like, they didn't list trash service. Um, they didn't list, they didn't list a lot of, a lot of stuff. So like they had, they had water, but they didn't have sewer with, I guess the expectation is that a lot of places your water and sewer bill are, are on the same bill, but that's not the way it is in St. Louis. Um, so there was some very specific things that there's still not guidance on, on things that are for, on, that are forgivable, but I'm telling you, I think that the payroll portion alone would make it really hard if you use the 24 week, week window and you get above 50, 60% employment for the entire, for the entire period, it would be really hard. I mean, I break out a calculator and get it and we, we can run some examples, but I don't see that being, you know, too hard to do. Go ahead, please. Okay, so I have a couple of questions. So does the December 30th date, does that throw out, the, or December 31st, does that throw out the June 30th date, or can you still use that date if you choose? No. Uh, June 30th is only if you're going to use the eight-week window. And I suggest if anyone has a dollar left in their PPP accounts, still keep using that money. And then also just remember, you have probably you probably have spent 20% of, of the money that you've already gone through that's not forgivable anyway, not even intentionally, just because of the taxes and things like that. So even if you, let's say you had a $100,000 loan, you paid payroll for these eight weeks, there's probably 20,000 you were going to be on the hook for. I was certain I was going to be on the hook for about $32,000 uh, is what I, I kind of figured out, um, you know, week by week on my on my taxes so far. And uh, and now I'm, I'm going to be able to spend past that point. So um, that's going to, that's going to be, that's going to be something to consider is the June 30th doesn't matter anymore. It, it just, it's, it's irrelevant at this point. Okay. All right. So then what I'm hearing is nothing's going to be forgiven technically until next year, because they we're not going to have the number from December 31st to be able to d decide whether or not it's forgiven, how much, et cetera. So yeah, that's, we're that's, not going to have an answer to the forgiveness amount until 2021. That's the dangerous part. So if you have spent all your money, that's why I started kind of, you know, prefacing the beginning of the conversation was if you have spent all your money and you're comfortable just doing it now, you could do your forgiveness now and be done with this. But I suggest really looking carefully at that because that's only going to be a small subset of people that that benefits the most. Right. Okay. I also have another question. Kim Jones wants to know, did you hear Matt? 
is it going to be taxed as income next year? Is our PPP money going to be taxed as income? It was never going to be taxed as income. Tom has a good good understanding of this. Tom, kind of describe what we've had some side conversations. It's not income, but it's yeah, but you're going to theoretically you're generating revenue at the cost of goods sold, so you're going to be more profitable than what you would have been without the PPP funds, and you're going to have to pay you know taxes on the profit as you would under you know any year, any circumstance. Yeah, that that there's some there's so some to have money, but. There is something else ahead, to it, sorry. but there is, um, it's not, it's not income in the tr traditional sense, but there was an IRS ruling on that. Uh, I, I'll go back to, I'll try and do some reading and, and, and come up with a note on that. There is something unique to that. Joe would, Joe would probably know if Joe's listening, put in the notes. He's probably busy today. Um, what was the next question? There's a lot of questions. Yeah. So, um, so Paula is asking about the, um, She's only used enough of her stuff for four weeks. Can she use it in 10 instead of eight? I said, yes, absolutely. But then she came back that, that she now has 24 weeks. Yeah. But then her question was, oh, no, this was another person. I'm sorry. So Diane is saying that hers was supposed to end this week, but she has two more weeks yeah. of, of money that she could pay to finish up. So you're saying if she goes past the eight weeks, I have to use it in 24 weeks now, right? Yeah. So basically either eight or 24. But you really have you really have more if you count the taxes you've paid and stuff like that, you really have more than two weeks because you should be reimbursing that that tax money back into it. What I think oops sorry I just shook my little computer stand here. What I suggest doing is this. Um, I, I segregated my PPP money into a separate bank account um, that just basically to, to keep this, keep track of this. And I was going to just kill that account at the end of this period and call it good. Well, now I'm just going to have it be my payroll. I'm just going to have it be my payroll account, um, for the rest of the year. So, so all I'm going to do is pay payroll and payroll related expenses out of that account. And that's it. And, um, so what I'm going to do is basically fund that every week for payroll out of my operations account. I'll transfer money in through the rest of the year. And, then you have a matching bank account um, for when you pull your reporting. Uh, but but just keep running payroll through the rest of the year. All of that payroll is technically forgivable against the PPP, not necessarily the money that you have. The dollars you spend to keep the economy going for the rest of the year are technically forgivable, even though you only have so much. Um, I wish that they would do the tax credits too, but I think this change in the PPP might stop that uh, from happening. Yeah, the double double dipping kind of. So what we did was we um, paid out of our payroll account, but we also put money in. So we put our PPP money in, we spent our payroll, and then we added money to cover our FICA, et cetera. Yeah. So we actually, the money that, when that money's gone, the money really is all of all of my money being gone. Yeah, that's, that's and that's a good practice. So Kyle Walker and I kind of had a discussion and he's been doing that all along too. I've just been staying on the reporting on top of it. And I, I had planned to make a transfer in. Uh, now towards the end of this, all I'm going to do is basically when I run my payroll and get my get the amount of cash that I need, uh, I'll run that on, May, on Monday to get my cash requirements. I'll, I'll put that money from operations into my, into my, uh, into my uh, bank account for payroll and uh, just keep that rolling. By the time you're done, out of, yeah. out of expense, if you will, that would qualify as a, as a PPP expense is going to be much larger than the PPP fund you got. So, exactly. I mean, yeah. so especially if you take the 24 weeks, the bank might come back and say, well, gee, I don't know if we can give you credit for that. Well, fine, throw it out. I'm still, you know, yeah. three times all those tic tac -y things that we were looking for to like make sure that those expenses were covered, unless you're going to use the eight week window, I wouldn't even worry about it. The other thing that they did do, which doesn't really apply to our kinds of businesses as much is, is they dropped the amount of non-payroll expenses down from 75% to 60%. But that's a hard number. If you go, if you go below 60%, uh, none of your loan is forgivable. Zero. Like that's a, that's a hard, that's a hard floor. 
So there's no adjustment. There's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for restaurants and things like that, um, you know, where they might have some more higher fixed costs, you know, things like that, 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 that's, that's fine, but they can only count 60% of it towards that. And if they burnt up all their money on fixed costs because, and they didn't bring people back, they're going to be in trouble on this deal. So just remember that. Um, yeah. You know, so we that, have a question here about the idle too. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tom. So back to the 60%, this was a letter that uh, the Treasury uh, Secretary Mnuchin sent out in concert with the SBA uh, administrator. I think this came out yesterday. And they addressed the 60% thing. And they wanted it a little funny. Let's take a look at that just for a minute because this is important. Lower the requirements. They lower the requirements that same 5% of the borrower's loans proceeds must be used for payroll and that 75% of the loan forgiveness must have been spent on payroll costs during the 24 week uh, forgiveness period, 60% for each of these requirements. So they took it from 75 to 60. If a borrower uses less than 60% of the loan amount for payroll costs during the forgiveness period, then the borrower will continue to be eligible for loan forgiveness subject to at least 60% of a loan forgiveness amount that has been used for payroll calls. So even if you only spent 50% of your PPP money on payroll, you can still get some money forgiven. Basically they'll, you know, they won't forgive all of it, but. Well, for- the, non, the non-payroll stuff won't be forgiven, though. That's the problem. So if you did spend a bunch of money above that 60%, that's where I, I guess where I'm not clear on is, and I don't think that really applies to our kinds of businesses. If you if you have that high of fixed costs in our business, you probably have Something's problems. Good for you. Yeah, that you should, you, especially with okay. the weeks, you should be able to spend all this money on payroll. Yeah, I would think it would be very, I mean, I run really lean and I know that, you know, I know that my operating costs, uh, as far as a function of like, you know, my fixed costs compared to, you know, compared to my variable costs are maybe 5%. I mean, I would, I would struggle to find that. I mean, our rent is, you know, 1500 on, on a business that does, you know, $180,000 a month, you know, pre COVID. I mean, that, what is that? That's like not even 1% just towards rent. And I know that, uh, and, and I and I know that you know we don't have anything glamorous you know to show for that. It's just you know it's a you know small office and we we run kind of remote. But we've got a lot of overhead in our business, and we couldn't come close to spending twenty five percent of it on overhead. Yeah, and yeah, you have a different you have a different model where you have you know several different businesses running out of one roof too, and there's just no there's just no way to do that. I mean, you've got four businesses at least running out of one roof, and it's still not even, it's probably still not even possible, even sharing that or, or delegating all that expense to one business. It's probably impossible. Here's, here's just a quick, uh, you know, continuation of the question about paying taxes on the PPP money. What it comes down to is you're going to pay taxes on your profit. And because in this example, you had a $200,000 PPP loan and the presumption is that it was forgiven, then you know, you say you had a marginal tax rate of 30%, then you're paying an extra $60,000 in taxes. You're not really paying taxes on the PPP loan, but if these $200,000 went to cover payroll that normally would be an expense, then you made $200,000 more this year than what you would have otherwise. So you're going to have to pay money on the tax you made. And if you use these PPP funds correctly, then you're going to be paying you're going to make more money, hence you're going to be paying more taxes. So it's kind of the good news, bad news thing about making more money. You pay more taxes. Yeah, it is. It is definitely going to be, there's definitely going to be some consequences to that at the end, at the end of this. But, um, you know, that's why it's good to, to hold on to as much cash as you can through this. And most of us are going to be in a better cash position at the end of this. So that's sort of a, a good thing. But Susan had a question on the, the idle. What were you going to ask, Liz? Was that what you were uh, yeah, she says, um, what can the idle loan portion be used for or not be used for? Do you know how the SBA is going to track it? So we have some info on that. Um, yeah. her, her specific question is, I'm wondering if it can be used to rent an office space 
if I haven't had an office before. I have rooms in my home allocated for my business, but my home is currently condemned and I'm living elsewhere until my house is rebuilt. So I'm thinking it would be a good time to finally get an office space. I'm certain you could go to the SBA site and find the rules for what you can use for. That sounds like a completely legitimate business expense to me. The, you know, the, the idle funds were pretty flexible. There were things that you couldn't go spend it, you spend it on. You weren't really supposed to spend it on paying down pre-existing debt. Um, Tom, does that, does that sound right to you? That is correct. Um, but you can definitely use it to, you know, the PPP loan was basically to cover payroll, cover your, your, your cost of goods sold, so forth. And the idle was to cover operating expenses. I mean, yeah. you can pay well if you want to, but you got a lot more options with that. Susan, I would say that would be reasonable. And I, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to make a definitive without having read, I haven't read through the idle in a while, but from the last I remember, it's pretty flexible. I mean, you can't go out and use the money to go, you know, gamble and put it in, you know, the casinos and, and certainly at the stock market, anything like that. But again, you know, Tom uses the word money is fungible. I like this term because what it means is, is if you have been making money and then you're technically what you could be doing is spending down the proceeds of your loan and your, but your bank balance is going back up, right? Sort of like what we're seeing with the PPP. Well, now that money is unrestricted. You used, you used your idle loans to pay for, your um, business expenses like payroll and other and other functions, you could make the argument at that point that all of that other money, whatever you have left is unrestricted. So um, talk to your accountant about that, make sure that that is a good you know ruling on 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 that. but I, I think that's probably true and a good strategy. Um, again, I would be I would be cautious with uh, doing anything too much that's outside of the, the guidance or really anything that's outside the guidance. But obviously right there, rent or mortgage payments is listed. Yeah. They're, they're fairly. So Matt, you were, go ahead, Tom. No, they're just fairly generous on the idle. It's just about any, anything that you are normally paying for prior to getting the loan, you can use to continue to pay for those. And even if it was something that you weren't paying for, like office space or something like that, well, technically you were. If you were renting it out of your home, that was an expense. You basically just moved offices, but it's still a rent. You should you should be solid on that. Yeah, I, I see no I see no um, yeah I see no issue with that. But yeah, it, it seems like an, an obvious one there. But you know, we're just interpreting things as everybody else. So, but it looks like a, a go. Um, so Leslie wants to know, um, you were talking about utilities, Matt, some were listed, some were not. How about phone bills? Uh, yeah, I th there was some debate on that over the, over the call. Um, cause it got a PPP. Yeah, there was a little bit of debate on the call between a couple of the accountants for some reason. I don't, one of the guys said yes. One of the guys said he's not sure. So I'm going to go with yes, but. There was there was actually between a couple of the experts there was some debate on on uh, I thought telecommunications was listed pretty clearly under the utilities but for some reason there was a little bit of debate on the call yesterday that I was on um, I would I would argue that yes you're fine on that the stuff the stuff that was weird was like okay so they have transportation costs listed as as a utility and what does that mean so. It certainly doesn't mean you can go out and buy a car, right? Because it all has to be stuff that existed before the PPP funds, right? So um, there was some debate on whether if you had a fuel service management contract in place before PPP, well, that's a utility for, for um, you know, for, uh, and he's, Tom's fine. So phone is listed there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, gas, water, electricity. Yep. Yeah. And similar to previous ex expenses. Uh, that these service contract agreements were predated February fifteenth, twenty twenty. So exactly. So they they. Can't just be clear, clear. This is this is a CPA firm. Uh, this isn't coming from the uh, you know C SBA. So this isn't a, this isn't a guarantee that it's right. But I would, you know, I would argue that we're not going to even need to put any of that stuff on our. Doesn't matter, does it? Especially if you use them twenty four weeks. I, I feel like if we get up, I mean, okay. Who here could use 20% more staff today and probably fill it with business? I, I could. 
I mean, you know, I could probably take on 10 more staff members, which would be a 25% increase for me and, and fill my business. I could be back up to 100%. We are turning down deep clean after deep clean, which is new recurring customers that we're just not able to get. What we're doing is, is we're not offering them deep cleans. We're saying, we'll just jump right into recurring service with you. And we're putting them two weeks out and just crossing our fingers that all things work out with, you know, some people coming back off of, uh, you know, childcare leave and things like that. But we're not even selling deep cleans right now to anyone. Like we just can't put a job that would take two or three times the amount of, the amount of, you know, labor and, and time. And what we're telling them is just, uh, we're going to catch you up over time. We just cannot offer you a full deep clean. And we're just setting the expectations very low as to what they're getting. Um, and just really following that up with like clear expectation setting is that this is going to take weeks to get you caught back up several visits um, to do that. So we're doing that to try and avoid losing too many opportunities um, for new customers. So I do have to say though, Matt, I have been really pleasantly surprised by how many of our clients understand that it's going to cost more. It's going to take more time. There's more expenses and that they're, it, it's, it's like they um, know it's coming and they're so supportive right now. I mean, I, I know that they were really supportive when it was closing down. Um, people are, we're still having people saying, you know, I'm, I'm not ready yet. Donate my cleaning. And they've donated three, four cleanings at this point. So yep. I, I'm kind of surprised at how. If you watching your survey data, like uh, what is your, so I'll, I'll give you mine, but I mean, you know, uh, we're, we're normally at about 92 and a half, 93% uh, customer satisfaction on our survey, which would be if you're using quality driven, another great product would be probably like a 4.65 or a 4.7 would be our normal score. We're shooting up about like 97% on our surveys right now. Uh, from our customers. And I know we're not much better and I know our staff are hot and they're probably not doing as great a job. Although I just had someone clean our house today and they did a, they did a bang up job. I mean, so um, I'm going to have to to give her a, you know, you know, a, a high survey, you know, so we use a five point scale, but it, it, you know, rates them in percentages to give you a little bit more granular, granular detail uh, as to what's going on. But yeah, I'm finding the, the customers to be pretty understanding. We've had a couple of buttheads, but not too many, like, you know, most people have been pretty tolerable and nice and- That's a technical term for most people, there, Matt? <laughs> those VHs, is that your technical term, those VHs? Yeah, but- uh, <laughs> We had somebody slip us on a $400 deep clean about some really petty, petty stuff. And she's like, I'll pay you $100. And I told her I wouldn't even take her money. So you can tell her, I, you can tell I'm not the customer service guru, but I felt so insulted by her $100 offer. I was like, I'd rather not even, I'd rather not even take your money. So I've had one unpleasant thing and, and I decided I'm not talking to any customers until this is all over. Cause I don't want any of that. Like, uh, you know, so, cause I wasn't, I was not really happy with this lady at that point. So, you know, I, I don't need to do that stuff. That's not my, that's not what I'm good at. So. Did you did that let me talk to customers on the phone? No, I, know, I can't believe it. So she went, you. Went over. Yeah. She wanted <laughs> Stab an owner basically about how bad we did. I looked at the pictures and I was like, I don't agree that, you know, I just, I don't want to argue with you. I don't agree we did a great job. I think there could have been some room for improvement, but that's not how that I told her, I was like, that's not how services work. I mean, we, you're arguing the price after, after you ate the meal. I mean, we, we agreed and we had two people in your house for, you know, for a whole day just about, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it, it's just, you know, I was trying to be nice, but I was like, but I think we need to come to a conclusion where, you know, I, I tried to stay calm, but she just wanted to stab us and talk, you know, talk trash. I was like, I'll just not take your money. I'm going to just send you, I'll just, we, we send them a contract to basically say that they can't, you know, Matt, do us or I'm sorry, like that. but I'm sorry, Matt, but you have to come back through foundations again. I'm sorry. Why don't we, do we, we need to Run you back through there and you need to learn how to handle that <laughs> or stay off the phone, Matt. <laughs> I don't personally deal, deal with that stuff and I don't want to. So that's, you know, you I have, I have, you're so frustrated. <laughs> there would have been, I think you could have solved this for this lady. 
I would I would be surprised. But I'll you know what I'll give you her number and you can call her and see if you can settle it. That's awesome. I might be able to get that hundred bucks out of her. I, I could use an extra hundred bucks. <laughs> I do. <laughs> he just won't say. He's more so we need to move along. Um, yeah. Any other questions here, Liz? Um, no, I don't see any more on here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be giving that great. How are you charging for the mat? Um, I think she was talking about the 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 new clients. We're just putting them on recurring pricing, and then just using uh, Made Central to to <laughs> catch them up with additional cleaning. And Audra's right. Some people are like that. You're right about that, Audra. Uh, there are some people. A question about supplies and equipment. And I think that we were talking about the yeah. item at the time. Okay. Yeah, idle recovery. Okay. You're, you're, I wrote yeah. that. It would cover, it would, it would definitely cover the supply. <laughs> I think depends. You know, if it was, you could argue a, a car is equipment. And I think it has to be something that would be. I'd be more comfortable doing it with something that you could expense, maybe a vacuum cleaner even. I would talk to my accountant about that though. At some point, if you're buying expensive equipment, that might not be considered idle money. I don't know. The least probably. Then a purchase, a purchase outright might not make as much sense, but a lease might make, make more sense where it's like a direct expense versus you know, if it's a lease that you already had, definitely, because that's basically any ongoing expense that you had, you could, could, could pay that with the idle. If you went out and leased yourself a new Tesla or something, that might be a problem. I, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, Leslie is saying that her understanding is that the idle covers anything on your Schedule C. I don't know enough about I don't know enough about it to say to say yes or no. I haven't heard that. Yeah, I I think there's a list of on on the SBA they kind of give some pretty good guidance on it. It's pretty open to what you can use it for, but my understanding is you really shouldn't use it to take on new debt. Um, you really shouldn't use it to to pay down. Oh, I'm sorry, take on new debt. I think that was part of it. They don't want you to use it as like down payment money on more on more debt. Um, and then they don't want you to use it to pay down existing debt except to service that debt, but not necessarily to like you, you owed a bunch of money on something else, um, you know, to, to, to consolidate. Although, you know, that may, the guidance on that's going to all change. I don't know. Maybe you can use it to consolidate that if, if it would make your business more efficient or, you know, if you're paying 20% on a credit card you ran up right before this, it might, it might make sense to pay that down because that was all just, supplies and equipment, you know, so there's, th th that's a short term debt versus a long term liability. There's a lot to it. You probably need to talk to your accountant to get all that clear. I think that Megan was suggesting that uh, rather than using that money directly to pay down debt, even if it's um, a benefit to your company, like with credit card debt, et cetera, that you would use the additional monies that you're bringing in that are not idle to pay it down and then yeah. use yeah. idle monies to pay. More yeah. money, take like the, the PPP, pay all your payroll, and then for revenue, 50 cents out of every dollar that you typically get in revenue is going to payroll. You can take that 50 cents and use it to pay debts. That whole money's fungible thing. So you can pay whatever you want to pay with the money that you're making. And work. From the payroll and we're right about there so on so on direct on direct payroll um you know just to my employees we're back to doing about 32 to thirty-three thousand a week so not quite you know so we're, we're getting back up to where we were and our payroll you know not including managers um is like 14.5 somewhere around there so you put in the managers and i think we're at like 16.5 somewhere somewhere in there so yeah i think I mean, if you don't have a pretty good spread, we have a pretty good spread and we're not, again, a, a lot of that money is not being paid by us. So just remember like you, you should have a good amount of, of operating funds to pay your normal stuff back. And if, you're, if your operating account isn't growing at this point, then you probably have some other leaks you really need to fix at this point. There's probably some other leaks 
that you are, are in trouble with. If, if, if your operating account is not growing, then if you're covering your payroll every week with the PPP funds. Yeah. If, if you're generating revenue, I don't know if people are still shut down. I feel like 99% of the country is back open. If there are places that are not, and I'm speaking out of turn, if you're in a place like New York city or someplace like that, that is not reopened to residential cleaning. I know we have friends that were in Philadelphia, even a couple of weeks ago, things were, were just opening up and we'd been open for a couple of weeks before that. So I know it's all relative to where you are. So that could be where you are in that situation where you are spending money faster or a little bit faster than the rest of us. But at some point that should stabilize and you should be getting back on top of that. Fingers crossed for those people too, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Audrey Johnson did say, you know, buy America as much as possible. And that, that is actually in some of the, the language from, um, from the SBA on, on using the, the EIDL funds or EIDL funds is to, is to make sure your purchases are, um, if possible, from American firms. So that's, you know, that's not always easy to do because there's so many steps that a product went through. But maybe not going on to like you know China's eBay or whatever and, and purchasing directly from China, but using a you know a, an American distributor at least if you have to have a Chinese-made product or, or overseas product for sure. Well, that's um, interesting. Is there any additional forgiveness or incentive benefit? Well, it's, it's just in the lang. It's just in the language. There's nothing. There's nothing concrete to it that's going to put handcuffs on you if you something if you, that we have to do. I, I no, it's it's something. That be a good thing to do. I, I mean, I, I'm in support of it. I'm just wondering if there's yeah. consequences if it doesn't happen. So, you know, the average dollar spent in your community, the more local you can spend your money, you know, the more that it can circulate in your own community. And same thing with, you know, buying American, you know, that, that money circulates in our economy multiple times before it, you know, finally stops circulating and ends up in an investment account somewhere. Um, typically, my local bank basically <laughs> says that every dollar spent in in a local bank in st louis tends to get recirculated seven times in the st louis economy now i don't know about the i don't have any idea about how often time how many times a dollar turns over in the american economy but money that stays in local banks again from what their research says so if you use a local bank um six to seven times that money turns over in your local community so if you want to get really local um you know Buy from local mom and pop businesses as much as you can. If you have a distributor that's a little smaller, um, maybe they're five percent more. But you know that money helps grow your local economy a little bit more than buying from you know some giant. So if we're buying our supplies off of Amazon, for instance, or some you know outlet like that, then we're hurting our local economy and theoretically hurting our own business. I feel like if you need something fast. Amazon has its place, but if, if there's, if you can source things locally and have those relationships, I will tell you that it makes a difference to have a point of contact in almost all of your, in almost all of your relationships. I mean, I think, you know, you, you work as a distributor and, and you have relationships with these companies. When you can get someone on the phone, you have a question that you have and you need an answer to. I feel like, you know, my, my local uh, Jansan distributor, um, I'll give them a plug. We have, we have a couple, but but one of the smaller ones is New Systems out of St. Louis, and they're, they're, we have Ferguson facilities, we have you know industrial soap, we have a couple other like big national ones that we buy some stuff that we can't source, um, you know through them. We have you know microfibers we purchase elsewhere, um, but our local Jansan was able to get us the Victory sprayers that everybody wants to have, and the uh, you know, we have a good relationship with them on being able to get, uh, you know, chemicals when no one else was able to get chemicals and, um, you know, just being able to put a face to a name, go into their local trade shows. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of business happens face to face. That's why we all go to these conventions and meet people. And, and, you know, uh, I think that there's something to be said if you can have some local relationships, if they're selling the same product and it's within the same price point, you know, I, I like doing business with people that I can, Put a face to. I agree. Well, and I think we really all saw the value of local relationships when it was time to be getting our idol and our PPP loans, right? People that had some local relationships with their bankers were in a lot better position. Yeah. And the I, people that were kind of. I texted my banker today about something 
You know, uh, we have mobile deposit now, so I can, um, you know, instead of going to the bank, I mean, everyone's probably been doing that for years, but we've always been just making, you know, bank bag deposits still and, and you know, dropping them in the overnight. Well, we switched to this mobile deposit and we get a couple of pretty big checks from some of our commercial accounts. Well, I found out yesterday that our mobile deposit wasn't set up to take a check that big. And uh, so I texted him this morning and he fixed it. And by noon, I was able to deposit that check. If I had to call Bank of America and try and figure that out, how long would that take? Right. But I literally just texted Luke today and I said, you know, Luke, I need this. Turned it around by noon. I think I texted him at uh, like like nine before I went to a, I did a commercial walkthrough this morning. And I, I swear, I think it was it was he got back to me that it was done by the time I was done. It might have been 10 a.m. I walked in at nine done by 10. I think it was all I think it was all done in an hour. So that's that's, you know, just an example. But, you know, I well. Were there any other big changes to the PPP that we might want to be aware of, Matt? Anything else that we should be thinking about or? More. Those were the ones that kind of stuck out as kind of the big, as kind of the big, you know, things to really think about was, you know, the eight week versus the 24 week. Um, you know, that the cutoff is either now when your loan is up or the full year um, or, you know, the December 31st look back. So like the safe harbors are, are kind of, you know, done away with that June 30th look back and all that. So we're, we're going to, you know, you're going to have to use the whole year and there's, there's risk in that if you, you know, if you think that, you know, more shoes are going to fall this year. Right. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. I, go ahead. I just uh, remembered that one of the things that we had seen a little bit about was this idea that um, businesses doing less than a million dollars a year would not be on the audit. Um, uh, list not <laughs> and that they were. not automatically audited but you can still be audited no matter how how small your loan is and and just for reference the average loan uh, for the first PPP was two hundred thousand dollars and for the second round of PPP was fifty thousand dollars so you know I don't know what the average in, in total is going to be but most of the loans are going to be smaller than the million dollar threshold most loans will be smaller, but all loans over a million dollars are automatically going to be audited. And we are all subject to, to audit. So it's just very unlikely if you have a 50,000, 100,000, even a quarter of a million dollars, it seems like a lot of money to us, but you know, there's just so many at that level, at that $200,000 level or whatever, there's just so many at that level that they're not going to be able to, to have that much oversight on it. unless, unless you're just doing something outrageous and there have been some people caught doing some pretty outrageous stuff with this money already. Um, there are people that have created all their business documents, faked it, got the loans and were like buying Ferraris and things like that. I mean, they're, Whoa, they're a real thing. I thought that was sort of a, no, uh, like well, there have been a couple of instances. If you like, if you Google PPP uh, fraud, um, you can find a couple of stories of some people. Um, one of them, one of them, I read about earlier this week. And again, it was just—it's so blatant. And I, I don't know what ended up getting him caught, but you got to think about it, right? Like, I mean, they're not trying to make this so that they're—it's a gotcha. There were a lot of things in there at, at you know the beginning of this. There are a lot of things that we were trying to figure out on how to how to deal with this, but. Um, it's unlikely. So the, the short answer to what you're saying is it's unlikely if you're under a million dollars that you're going to be subject to an audit. Um, but we all, we all are subject to, to that. Yeah. yeah. Here, here are a couple of other bullet points and going back to, this is the uh, statement from uh, Steve Mnuchin. Um, I'll post this here. The safe Harbor you mentioned there's a couple of those. One is if you couldn't, uh, you know, fully get back to business because of complying with uh, requirements or guidance issued by the Secretary of Health, Human Services, Director of CDC, OSHA, so on and so forth. So if you couldn't hit your numbers because you were complying with what the government was telling you to comply, safe harbor means you kind of get a get a pass on that, right? Yeah. Uh, so what what does that mean exactly though? You you get it forgiven. You didn't hit your number, but they're going to forgive it because you've got, you know, you couldn't do it because CDC told you told you you couldn't work. Is that 
going to be going to be really subject to some businesses like entertainment. Um, you know, like if you're, you know, like there's a, I, I don't think we're going to be, we're going to, we're not going to have any real businesses that are not going to be up and running by December 31st as one of these numbers. Right. Um, check, check this one out though. Um, forgiveness based on reduction of FTE to provide protection to borrowers that were both unable to hire individuals uh, who were employees of the borrower on uh, February 15th and unable to hire, and unable to hire similarly qualified employees for unfilled positions by December 31st. So it's almost, I mean, you know, if you read that literally, it's like, I tried here, here with my Indeed ads and I just couldn't hire people. Yeah, that's going to be open to interpretation. But let, let's like, as an example, like, let's say you own a music venue, like we have, or let's even say even bigger, like a stadium for, for like sports. The Los Angeles Lakers. Yeah, the Los Angeles Lakers. You know, typically, typically there's probably a thousand people working at a game and they probably have several thousand people that work behind the scenes, like, you know, like, you know, that, that maybe are contractors or things like that. But, but let's say there's a thousand people to, to, to make a game happen for the 20,000 fans that come to a basketball game. Well, they're certainly not going to rehire them. And they're, and if they did take that money, they wouldn't have to make a, you know, they would they would just make a certification that they were unable to meet those standards, and they basically got to blow that money with you know without consequences. What I'm what I'm understanding. One other thing to to keep in mind, I think one uh, one thing if you haven't taken out the loan yet, is that it's a five year loan now for anyone that takes out a loan now versus a two year loan. That's another thing that we didn't really talk about. Um, yeah. So um, again, are forgiven, but we're working on the assumption it's going to be forgiven now, which makes that moot. But if you did have some you had to pay back, you've got a lot longer to do it. Yeah, and I, I don't think anyone should should come ac across that. And then uh, the deferral period is now is now extended for the rest of the year, from what I understand. So extended the deferral for borrow payments, principal and interest. Um, basically, if if I want to. It's basically for the entire covered period. So till the end of the year, there's no payments to make um, on any of the money. So you know you're you're gonna sit down at the beginning of the year and probably get all your tax stuff to, done quicker than you've ever done before. Uh, so you don't have to make that first PPP payment. So uh, I'm usually somebody that's filing an extension. I guarantee you, I'm gonna have my taxes ready to go December 31st, and you know be on top of this. That reminds me. Um personal income tax. Is that due July 15th now? Is that still the July, July 15th uh, business and personal, I believe. I didn't think, I don't think that, uh, and you can file an extension until I think till the end of the year. <laughs> well, but you, know, you don't have any penalties or interest to July 15th, which is really pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still figuring out. I still haven't done mine. I'm actually still figuring out some tax credit stuff from last year. So, that's uh, that's still on the back burner. Hmm. I haven't done that either. All okay. right. Well, let's let's figure out. We're getting late. It's two fifty nine. Here, let's run through this real quick. Hey, Matt. I really like that um, we bring you on as a guest, and then you thank us for bringing you. <laughs> and, and you're such a huge benefit uh, to us. Bye. I give you guys a chance not to talk the whole time because I talk so much. So it works out well for you guys to get a break for your voice since you guys do these all week. Well, I, I got to say, you are excellent. Like, if I raise my hand, you are on it. So I, I kind of appreciate that. It's like a presidential debate. You raise your hand when you have something to say. Okay. Works out well. Yeah, Martha Woodward is going to be joining us tomorrow, culture building during the reopening. So, I mean, I guess, um, how do you read that, Liz? I guess there's a lot of opportunities here during this unprecedented event when you're reopening to, you know, build upon the things that you want to build upon and correct things maybe that weren't going in the direction you wanted them to go. Yeah, everything is new. It's kind of like a like a, a, a do-over for so many things. And I, I'm pretty sure that Martha is going to be talking to us about you know, how to be building your culture and how this is a prime opportunity for you. If you were having any kind of culture issues before, how now, great opportunity for you. And I will say so that I think it's 
Martha yeah. has really honed this over the last couple of years. Like I've, I've, you know, sat in on what she's teaching a little bit. I'm, I'm really excited about what she's doing and, and the things she's teaching. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's fundamental stuff, but it's just executed well. So yeah, tomorrow, five o'clock Eastern, um, you don't want to miss that. Martha's going to do, uh, do a very good opportunity to hear what we need to know about uh, building culture and taking this as an opportunity to do a reboot if we want to. I mean, we've paid, we've paid a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears to get to this point to have this opportunity. Let's, uh, let's, not, let's not miss it. Um, Paul Weber, he's a uh, friend of Liz's out uh, in, in Washington doing financial planning for employees, which is really kind of important too. I mean, hiring is, is getting, getting to be tough, at least. You know, we're, we're finding that to be true in some of our branches and the more value you can create for your, your employees. And I think we're going to be hearing more and more about this in terms of as employers. We've got we got a bigger obligation to our workforce and we've got to be helping our employees, you know, have a better life and build wealth. And and that's important. That's, that's going to be something we're going to be learning Thursday and Friday is going to be on the spot. And that is a activity that we do in foundations where it's a rapid fire Q and a session where somebody has a question and Liz and myself and our special guest who you'll find out who it is on Friday, all get one minute a piece to answer that question. So there's a clock that's ticking and once the 60 seconds is up, bam, we're done and it goes to the next person. So we can cover a lot of material real quick with that. And that's gonna be fun. Um, yeah, that, that will be fun. I always love on the spot. Leslie wants to know about um, Sean getting the information out. Tom, did he get to you yet? He didn't, and I have not had a chance to follow up with him yet. But uh, I will. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for, for reminding me. We will, we will get that. Okay. Well, uh, well, great stuff today, Matt. Thanks so much for keeping us updated. Super, super helpful. I know Diane's saying the same thing. Thanks, Matt. She loved this. Yeah. So, feels good having somebody that's like in the know and can answer those very little specific -y questions. And you are young. Specific. -y. You guys for being here, you're 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 probably you're probably way more ahead of than most people. You guys really should, you know, you really should give yourself credit that you know a lot more than a lot of other business owners. I talk to a lot of people, they're not here doing things like this and asking questions. So, you know, give yourself a pat on the back for showing up every day. There's a lot to learn and just being doing stuff like this helps. A lot of people on this call that are here on a regular basis too. So yeah, good point, Matt. So mark your calendars, be here tomorrow, five o'clock Eastern for, for Martha. It's going to rock. Matt, thank you for your help. This was useful information, stuff that we all need to know and uh, be safe. And we'll see you tomorrow at five. Bye y'all.